Our next speaker is Richard Barnes uh, from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, his field is in computational ecology and geoscience, and his advisor is John Hart. Uh, and he did his practicum at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in 2016. Hey, I'm Richard. And four years has just really flown by, and there's a lot I'd like to talk to you about. I'd like to talk to you about how perennial grains have these interesting evolutionary equilibria and how we can escape them in order to make agriculture better. About why gerrymandering is a really hard problem to solve, harder than you might think. About how salamanders are actually a proxy for punctuated equilibrium equilibrium and how we can explain that by coupling geologic and ecological models together. But the questions that I want to talk about today are motivated more by hydrology and its intersection with geology, a field known as geomorphology. And a motivating question for me when I started this work was how can we prevent agricultural runoff from polluting surface waters? And it's a tough problem to solve because you have limited budgets in order to do remediation. And the intersection between agriculture and water is essentially ubiquitous. And so it's a bit of an optimization problem. And in order to solve it, you need a holistic understanding of where water is and where it's going. There are related questions, how do landscapes evolve? And another one, is this a good way to cut metal? And they're all connected, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But it's a tough problem to solve because the resolution of our data has been increasing dramatically over the last decade, up to the point where we have one meter resolution for really large areas. The circumpolar region north of 60 degrees is three times the size of the continental United States. And we expect data of this resolution to cover all of North America within a few years and the world soon. And that'll be updatable on a weekly basis. How do you make sense of that kind of data? And this is mixed in with this challenge in computation, right? Like the number of flops per core is holding steady. The number of cores is going up. Um, there's this gap between processing and memory. Um, and you might ask, well, can't we deal with that with specialized hardware? And sure, if you can make your algorithm look like machine learning. But in, in some algorithms, that's harder. Graph algorithms are one of these cases. Combinatorial algorithms are another. So here's the game we're going to play. I have elevation fields that come from stereoscopic satellite imagery. Water is going to flow over the landscape. It's going to go downhill. It's going to converge. I want to know how much water is going to pass through a given point. But there's a depressing problem here. That water might end up in a local minima, and it can't escape. So I need to help it out. I need to lift it out of there. And it turns out that there's a way of doing this where you can move inwards from the edge of your data set and fill in depressions so they form level surfaces or carve channels that allow water to escape. And when I first looked at this problem, the methods people had for doing this were, in a sense, primitive. So before we go parallel, we want to have good serial algorithms, right? And it turns out that if you improve the serial algorithms, you can throw away all your extra processors because these level lines here are what you get if you move from an order n squared um, solution to an order n solution. Um, and that means that in production code, you now have a 25,000 times speed up, which is nice. Um, and I thought when I put this paper in, you know, will, will anyone ever use this? But I never dreamt that people would use it for murder. <laughs> um, but they've also used it for studying the cosmic microwave background radiation, the formation of the universe, and for studying biological membranes. Landscapes, it turns out, are ubiquitous in science, or so it seems. There's another problem that I encounter in my work, and that's flat areas. When water hits a place with no local gradients, it doesn't know where to go. And uh, nature figures that out, but sans nature, we have to develop some kind of proxy in order to solve the problem. So here's one idea. Water flows towards lower grounds, and it flows away from higher grounds. And these two processes coupled give you a really nice looking convergent flow field. We won't discuss how realistic that is, but I will assert that on the scale of continents, this is a good enough approximation. And again, the serial algorithms for this were not great. 
And it turns out that there are better ways of doing it that reduce you from having to take an hour with 60, or 16 CPUs to 30 seconds with one CPU. Um, so having done that, and this again is useful for things other than what I expected, such as evaluating sheet metal, um, how do we scale to continents? Um, and this is where things get exciting from an algorithmic perspective. So what we can do is we can take our data set, and it comes to us in tiles, and those tiles are typically 3,000 by 3,000 or 10,000 by 10,000 cells. And the trick is, can you turn this kind of propagating wavefront graph algorithm into something that's representable, representable by something less than that area? And it turns out you can. You can reduce it to a perimeter representation. You can form some graphs that reduce the interior information of these tiles. You can make a really big graph. And you can solve that graph. And that brings us finally to this question of, can you figure out how much flow is passing through a point? And it turns out you can. Um, tricky problem, again, because upstream flow goes downstream, goes downstream, goes downstream. So to know how much you have at one point, you need to look upstream, upstream, upstream. The problem has dependencies. But you can turn those dependencies into a really big system of unknowns. And you can solve those. And the nice thing about this is that this setup that I've come up with is what's known as a communication avoiding algorithm. Earlier, I had a chart where CPU speed was diverging from memory speed, a trend in computing. And that means that any time we can avoid communicating with memory, much less between nodes, we're winning. And this is an algorithm that minimizes that communication to a fixed number of events and a fixed amount of data movement per tile. And that allows me to run this not only on a supercomputer in a fully parallel fashion with 14,000 cores, which is what you need in order to exploit the full parallelism of the problem, but I can also run this on my laptop. And it efficiently uses the hard drive because each one of these tiles needs to be touched a fixed number of times regardless of the problem size. Um, and this successfully raised the bar of what it was possible to do in this field by three orders of magnitude, to the point where I had run out of adjectives to describe what this work meant. So I refer to it as being rather large. <laughs> Let's talk about landscape evolution models. So we've gone really big. And that's useful for solving some problems, like separating agricultural pollution from water. But there are other problems where you just want to iterate little data sets really, really fast. And that's useful for being able to describe how a landscape changes over time when you have uncertainty in what equations might govern that evolution and what parameters might instantiate those equations. And is this useful? Yes, because it turns out that nuclear waste storage is an application where geology intersects with human interests in a really real way. And when people began studying this problem over the last couple of years, it took something like a million compute hours to solve this problem at a low resolution. And as I think you might have some suspicions, it's possible to speed that up a bit. Um, and so you have a topological question. We can make directed acyclic graphs out of these flow problems. And uh, it turns out in the field, stack order was preferred. People like their depth first search traversals of graphs. If you switch to a breadth first traversal, you get uh, significantly more parallelism. What does that look like? Um, when you use a depth first traversal, when you try to parallelize that, you run out of parallelism quickly. And you have these long computational tails where you're waiting on just a few elements. Um, but in a breadth first paradigm, you're able to maintain high parallelism, and you have a short tail on your distribution. Um, but what about CPUs? Everyone is like, GPUs, they're so fast, they're so great. And I wrote something that uses GPUs, and now my code is fast. But the, the thing is, those people put a lot of thought into the GPU, because the GPU is like a binary. Either you did it right, and your code goes fast, or you did it wrong, and your code doesn't work. <laughs> and so the result is that by the time it works on the GPU, well, of course it's fast. But did you put similar thought into the CPU? Because that architecture is growing so complicated. Now there are so many cores. Are you using them effectively? And so a lot of people don't actually do the comparison work of optimizing the CPU code and comparing it against the GPU code. And for this particular problem, I've done that. And you can see that the CPU is actually quite competitive. And this is interesting for heterogeneous systems like Summit, where you've got something like six GPUs plugged into a really badass CPU. 
can you use all of that computational power? Um, this is the other thing about GPUs, right? When you're on the bleeding edge, sometimes you, you have problems in your code and you're questioning yourself. You're like, is my life only a warning to others? Um, <laughs> but after you rule out all of the other problems, just like Sherlock Holmes, right? Only what's possible is left. And uh, sometimes it's not your fault, which is nice. Um, <laughs> so a lot of what I've talked about are these kind of specialized algorithms. And there, there are more general formulations, right? Like the linear algebra of graphs says that we can represent sparse graphs using these computations that are ubiquitous in science. Why would I not use a tool like this if it's so general? Um, one of the reasons is that these, uh, these sparse representations tend to come in these kind of unattractively complicated libraries. Um, another reason for this is that, nope, let's just stick with that reason. <laughs> um, unattractively complex libraries. Um, when I started working on this code, there was a question of w what was it that I valued? Um, because when we, we begin to write code, we express not only science, we instantiate not only ideas, but we instantiate our values, and we instantiate our beliefs about how we should interact with computers. And some people are searching for peak performance. But in the fields that I interface with, using the kind of computation that we talk about every day here is not something that people are actively aware of or know how to do. And so there is a whole suite of tools that is, in essence, outside of their Overton window, outside the realm of what they can talk about or make use of. And so the previous work that I've shown makes use of, instead of CUDA, OpenMP, OpenACC, why would you do graph algorithms using these kind of primitive tools? Because this allows me to write the code in a way where it's adaptable and useful to the fields that I'm interfacing with. And this is true of my other work as well. Python is a slow language, but if I can make it talk to C++ in a way that hides this underlying complexity, then that allows me to make my work communicable, right? And a couple of years ago, I got a hold of an associate editorship with one of the journals for my field. And with this ultimate cosmic power, I was able to impose values on this field. And one of the values that I imposed was that we're going to release our source code, and it's going to be well commented. Um, <laughs> And now a couple of years later, the magazine, this journal, doesn't accept anything that isn't open source. And so part of what I want to do with my work is to try to not only make code useful to people, but to make that the norm, that we make useful code, that we make algorithms that can be reused so that science doesn't languish in magazines, but instead is out there for the world. Um, so some applications of what I've done, uh, aside from sheet metal, aside from murder, um, <laughs> groundwater flow. It turns out that uh, standing surface water and groundwater have important climatological impacts. And the, the, the methods that were used for doing this were essentially these iterative relaxations where you would move some of your water downstream and then the gradient gradually gets shallower until you eventually reach a point where you're within some kind of air tolerance. And it takes something like a week to do an iteration of a global surface water model that way. Um, using these methods, you can do it in about 30 seconds. And that allows you to finally begin to incorporate the movement of water into something like a climatological context. Um, global river migration. I wasn't able to use my 2011 ThinkPad for this, so I'm hoping Windows works. Um, this is the Ucale River in Brazil, and it's about a kilometer wide, and you can see it's just on like a collision course with this city. And we don't understand why it is that rivers move like they do. And you could study this for one river, but you're essentially then doing a case study of a really complicated phenomena. Um, what we need to do instead, I believe, is to look at every river everywhere. And I've built the methods for doing that, so I'm working on that with uh, some folks at Berkeley. Um, Another application, landslide prediction. Um, in order to calculate where landslides are, you have like forces that are pushing soil down slope. You have resistive forces. There's an optimization problem here. Which collection of cells collectively has enough force to fail? 
Um, once you know where the water is, you can start to talk about that. It turns out it's an NP-hard problem, but there's a continuous relaxation. Um, so that's also solvable. So collectively, I, I think that over the past couple of years, my work has really evolved in the direction of HPC in a place where people weren't using it a lot. And I think that it's been a, a really pleasurable experience to kind of explore that trade-off curve between what people can use and what performance we can get. And I think that that curve defines kind of the, the point of the CSGF to be able to, to move all these fields forward. And I'll take questions. <laughs>